Dear viewers, welcome to Positivi and Good TV special interviews. Positivi interviewed retired Colonel Douglas McCracker on the 11th of November 2023. Again, my message to the Finns, you have a wonderful country. You've worked hard to keep it that way. You need to preserve it and protect it. McCracker has a PhD from the University of Virginia. He has been awarded with several medals. He has published five books and many articles. He has been appointed by President as a senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense, an international security strategist, and he has also served in Iraq in 1991 as a combat leader in the largest U.S. tank war since World War II. So you put all of that together and now here's the United States that is delighted with the opportunity to turn Finland into a forward base for American military power designed to threaten Russia. And that's what you want to do with your country, right? That's insane. McCracker has also led the Allied Operations Center in Europe, as well as served in numerous positions in the U.S. Army. What would be your message to a Finnish reserve uh, reservist? Your constitution is spot on, and you should cling to that. Prior to the interview, I informed the colonel that I will be interviewing him in my capacity as a journalist and a reservist sergeant of the Finnish Defense Force. Finland's 130,000 square miles area is about the same size as the land area of Montana. Finland has an 830 miles long border with Russia. All right, it's the 11th of November 2023. Colonel Douglas McCracker, welcome back. Um, we are very honored to have you. We talked last time one year ago, and all really? Bob is very different. Yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to I wanted to go you about the 20, 25 minutes interview through several things. Mm, Finland is now on the background preparing a DCA contract with the United States. Um, we we joined NATO. Uh, the process of joining NATO, from my point of view, was not legitimate. Uh, people were not asked. There was no possibility to vote uh, the people in power. That was not an issue in the previous election. It was it was not even mentioned. So they did this online survey research where one could participate if one uh, found out the website and wrote his or her name then one could get a question which would then ask if um, we should join NATO. And I, if I recall correctly, 1,160 people answered. And as of today, I have not found any single Finn who would have answered that questionnaire. And our president, commander-in-chief of our defense forces, our prime minister and the future president candidates all have come out and said that this was the will of the people. And Finland is a sovereign republic still on the paper. Uh, we don't have a military, we have defense force, which is fairly large when you take in consideration that we are only 5.5 million people. We have a very long border with Russia, a very important neighbor. We have been, a lot of our wealth is built upon the trade with, with Russia. And now we find ourselves uh, I miss uh, as our one of one of the newly uh, elected presidential candidates, Alexander Stupp, called us uh, the frontier. So, what are your thoughts on the? If we jump straight to the to the position of Finland and the and the NATO join, joining NATO, and and then let's get from that on onwards. I suppose the, the first question to ask, if I were Finnish is why it suddenly makes sense today to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization when for the last uh, nearly 70 years, the Finns have found it uh, convenient to remain neutral. And whether or not that neutrality is somehow or another harmed Finland, that would be my first question. If, if neutrality has harmed Finland and Finnish interests, if it has harmed you in, in commercial terms or business terms, or it has harmed you with regard to your relations with your neighbors, Sweden and Russia, or the, the Baltic states, what, then if, if it hasn't been a negative on the whole, then why change it? 
you know, simply changing something at this particular point in time doesn't strike me as being a, a particularly rational thing to do. I always regarded the Finns as uh, among the more rational peoples in Europe. So I would ask you, what has changed that, that now the Finnish people and their armed forces want to be part of this uh, NATO alliance, which frankly now is very different from what NATO was previously. NATO historically was purely defensive, and it was aimed at deterring or preventing the Soviet Union from threatening Europe, Western Europe in particular. Uh, since uh, the collapse of the Soviet state and its uh, Warsaw Pact system, uh, NATO has become increasingly aggressive, pushing further and further east towards Russia, and as a result has ended up in a position of hostility towards Russia. Now, Finland has not been historically, in that sense, so certainly not for the last 50 years, hostile to Russia. That doesn't mean that the Finns are not concerned about the security of their borders and their, their national sovereign republic. They obviously are. They wouldn't maintain the forces they do. But is there is there any evidence that the current Russian state uh, wants to mobilize armies for the purpose of invading Finland? Uh, that's my first question. I, I don't see any. Uh, has the, the current Russian state uh, threatened Finland in some way, or, or has it tried to bully Finland into supporting something it would otherwise not support? I, mean, I, I, have, I have difficulty finding a good answer to those questions. So, you know, and then I would say, last of all, given the size of your population, which is relatively small, as you point out, I'm curious as to why there was not a public referendum on the question. Uh, why were the Finnish people not asked to vote? It's not as though you have a nation of three or 400 million. Uh, then it becomes much more difficult to hold referendums. But in your case, it's a very straightforward affair. But there seems to have been an effort to do this without really consulting the Finnish people or giving them a chance to think about it or debate it. So, I, you know, I don't really understand it. Maybe you could explain it to me. Why now? Because I don't see the threats to Finland that once existed in the Soviet Union. I don't see a Soviet-style state. Russia, whatever its imperfections, is probably closer to what it was uh, under the czars in many respects, but it's also a far more humane state in many ways. Uh, I think Russia is developing in a more positive direction than people give it credit for. So I, <clears throat> again, I'm, I'm at a loss to explain why the Finns of all people would feel the need to do this. Sir, you pointed out there, I think the two major things, one is the, the completely missing debate. So there was absolutely no debate, or if there was a debate, it was a consensus debate where only one-minded people debated basically some irrelevant facts regarding NATO, whether whether uh, we send their troops or whether they come here and so on. The other thing was that you asked that why the question of why it's also in my head it was fed to the people that that putin has an imperialistic agenda to return the soviet borders but even if that would be true finland was never part of soviet union so even that argument wouldn't go go if it would be debated but because there was no debate and there was the fear um this kind of mass psychosis ingested into the whole population with the COVID scam and it followed right away i mean put in whatever once want to say about him he ended the COVID in one day and uh then we shifted the full gear war narrative and and we kind of aligned ourselves um i know when i say we i mean only the the people who were elected by, by the people aligned themselves with Ukraine and started sending weapons and money to there. And and kind of, I had a feeling that um, they, they rushed into it. They didn't know what to do. And they went too deep, too fast that they could back up. And, and this whole narrative took over that Russia is a threat, even though they have explicitly said that the Finland, they don't see Finland as a threat, except now. I mean, now, of course, it's changing because... NATO was one thing, and I'm really concerned about the DCA contract as it allows the troops to come here, use our bases freely. And we don't know what the contract actually states. 
uh, it's not uh, readable anywhere. One cannot access it. Even the parliament members don't know what it states. It's only prepared on the bureaucratic level. They say it will come in some point to discussion, but we don't know what it says. And so, so what do you know about the DCA agreement? What could it mean in 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 your point of view? What what would you say it would mean? Well, I I don't know the details, but I know the very what I would call Cold War thinking in Washington. And Washington inevitably wants to establish bases in close proximity to states that it regards as either dangerous competitors or simply unwilling to bow to Washington's will within the framework of the global financial system and trade. So obviously, you know, we have a total, I think, of 12 bases today in Iraq. And the argument is that those bases, which are at the moment uh, under attack, by militias inside Iraq are there to quote unquote contain Iran. But there's no evidence that the Iranians are invading Iraq. In fact, for all intents and purposes, Iran and Iraq are on extremely positive, uh, on a positive basis. They, they have uh, agreements in place. They're dependent upon each other for trade. So I don't know why the bases are there other than to theoretically threaten Iran. My fear would be that, you know, we would try to establish bases in Finland, whose only mission is to threaten Russia, uh, not necessarily to defend Finland. It's not as though you're under imminent uh, threat of attack. That's that's the problem. Let, let me go back a, a short time in history and just point out a couple of interactions I've had with the Finnish authorities. I saw the Finns uh, very active in the Balkans, particularly in Bosnia-Herzegovina and subsequently in Kosovo. The Finns played a very positive role. The Finns were, were judged or viewed by everyone as impartial observers, people who could be relied upon to come in, examine the, the conditions, and speak the truth. That did not always sit well with the West, and particularly the United States, because the Finns would come in and they would examine the site of an alleged massacre or atrocity, and they would frequently say, we see no evidence that the Serbs are responsible for this. The Serbs did not, in fact, do these things. These were done by others. That wasn't welcome in the West, but of course, that gave the Finns tremendous credibility with the Serbs, and I would say, by definition, with the Russians. When events in eastern Ukraine started, I was one of those people that early on suggested that we call a ceasefire as soon as possible. And then we asked the Finns and the Austrians, who were both neutral, to play a role in separating the forces and facilitating negotiations. <clears throat> in fact, uh, I thought of the Finns in particular because the Russians trusted the Finns. I saw that in action. The Russians absolutely trusted whatever the Finns said. They trusted the Finnish president of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. So my, my surprise was based on the fact that why would Finland want to destroy this essentially positive relationship? What's the, what's the rationale for it? What's the justification for it? I don't see one. Now, Finns need to understand something else. <clears throat> we are at a turning point in the United States. We are in a lot of trouble financially. Our uh, debt to GDP ratio is over 120% and climbing. The debt servicing payment on an annual basis is now over a trillion dollars. Uh, I don't see how we get out from under this debt without making profound cuts in spending. <clears throat> that would probably also have to be accompanied by some form of default, which will be dressed up as restructuring our debt. <clears throat> Those things, frankly speaking, militate against further expansion of U.S. military commitments around the world, and certainly against expansion of any military commitment in Finland. And the commitments that I know people are talking about are, are base-related, bases where U.S. forces with missiles and aircraft could show up and essentially put Finland at risk of attack by the Russians, the very thing that uh, my impression is you don't want to have happen. So I don't see any particular reason why at this stage in this DCA, you would want to grant that kind of access and make yourselves dependent upon U.S. military power. 
there's something else. Remember <clears throat> that during World War II, and this was actually in 1940, Churchill uh, wanted to move British and French forces across Sweden to support the Finns against the Soviets. Well, the Swedes would not permit that, for, and uh, we know the rest of the history. That was a very difficult proposition then. Imagine today in a world where you could have on your front a quarter of a million, 400,000, 500,000 Russian troops in short order. You're within easy range of all their tactical and, and theater ballistic missiles. And you are then depending upon us, and we are 7,000 miles away, to show up suddenly and provide you with support and defense. That's not realistic. Unless you're unless you want to risk a nuclear exchange, and I don't see any evidence that we or the Russians or the Chinese or anybody else at this stage want to risk a nuclear exchange, that means that we would have to move conventional forces. Well, our conventional forces would have to come by sea. The the North Atlantic would be full of Russian submarines that would sink anything that tried to cross with US forces. We haven't even begun to discuss the missiles with great precision that can be launched over a thousand miles, it could interrupt virtually every other kind of support. In other words, this is not 1950, this is not 1965, this is 2023, technology has changed. And then finally, if we indeed are going down this road to financial ruin, and I think we are, we're simply not gonna be able to afford any of it. So I, I don't see a future in it, to be blunt with you. I don't think the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is going to survive this war with Ukraine. And let's back up again and talk a little bit about Russia and Ukraine. Everyone has contended from day one that, that Putin wants desperately to regain control of Eastern Europe, including Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Yet when the war began, it was very obvious to everyone when the Ukrainians made it clear they would not negotiate an agreement largely at our insistence, because at the end of uh, April, it was clear that the president of Ukraine was willing to accept neutrality and would go along with some sort of arrangement. Everyone concluded that the Russian military, particularly its army, is just too small for the job. Well, if the Russian army was too small at the beginning, what evidence is there is that the Russian army was being prepared to attack Eastern Europe? I mean, it's pure nonsense. The Russians agreed it was too small, and they went to a defensive posture starting in the summer, which has lasted uh, certainly since then, well into April, May, and June. They set up a defense, and then they, the Ukrainians obliged them by attacking them. But in the meantime, the Russian military establishment has grown exponentially. And now they have a force of perhaps a million, probably will go to 1.2 million before they're through, and they have 750,000 Russian troops focused largely on, U on Ukraine or inside of it. They've also expanded their relationship and their military reach now through Belarusia. So in effect, what we've gotten is the very thing that we, were, we said we were setting out to stop. We have provoked Russia. We've convinced the Russians that they can't trust us, convinced them that we are a an unreliable partner. We are incurably hostile to Russia. And as a result, they've massively built a new military establishment that has enormous offensive fighting power. However, despite all of that, Russian forces have moved very cautiously in Ukraine. They've exercised tremendous restraint despite numerous provocations. Uh, we haven't seen the Russians deliberately attack many areas in, in Western Ukraine, particularly Key, key for Kiev, they could have shut that down very quickly if they'd wanted two months ago. On the other hand, the Ukrainians have done everything in their power to attack Russian civilians, Russian targets in Russian cities, Moscow itself. And yet Mr. Putin has exercised restraint and held back his force. And people are asking now, well, if the Russians can march largely unopposed, or at least against minimal opposition all the way to the Dnieper River and potentially beyond, why aren't they doing it? Because the Russians don't want to govern Ukrainians. The areas they currently controlled are filled with Russians. And it was always their concern about Russians being treat treated equally before the law that brought them into Ukraine and the buildup, this enormous force 
that we trained and equipped. It was allegedly, and it probably was the best force ground force in NATO. And it was designed to do one thing, attack Russia. So naturally, the Russians finally attacked. After 14,000 Russians had been killed in eastern Ukraine between 2014 and uh, 2022. None of, none of the narratives make any sense in the West. And Putin's behavior to this point in time demonstrates to me three things. Number one, he wants to secure Russia. He doesn't want to govern non-Russians, particularly people in Eastern Europe. And thirdly, he'd like to get back to some form of normalcy that would allow him to conduct business with the West. He does not hate the West. That's nonsense. So you put all of that together, and now... Here's the United States that is delighted with the opportunity to turn Finland into a forward base for American military power designed to threaten Russia. And that's what you want to do with your country, right? That's insane. It makes no sense why any Finn would turn his country over to the United States for that purpose at this stage of history makes no sense. Thank you for the insights. Um, um, you pointed out there the financial system, and and uh, I've been thinking here that kind of generally when we look at back to the history, it repeats itself that when when the financial system starts shaking or going towards collapse, um, it the war follows, and the cycle is war, peace, war, and peace, and it continues, and it it goes hand in hand with the financial system. Well, can so, I say something? I, I, I don't. I, I have to contradict you. Uh, wars do not happen after everything falls apart. They happen. Know. They happen when things recover. Hmm. I mean, Germany recovered more quickly from the uh, depression than the United States and other countries in Western Europe, for that matter. So did Italy. Uh, the point is that the Germans would not have attacked uh, Poland in 1939 if they were not healthy enough to do so. They had built a healthy force. They had a healthy population. It was very cohesive society. There was strong support for the new government. Uh, so I, I think it's a mistake to assume, well, if everything's falling apart, that means someone's going to attack. It's a false narrative. Because if you're bankrupt, how do you pay for the war? It can't be done. And remember that when the war began, when the Germans started moving into Western Europe, one of the first things they did was take all of the gold that was on hand in those countries and ship it back to Germany. So war, war to be successful has to be profitable. Germany gets in trouble when it invades the Soviet Union when there was no particular reason to do so at that point. It would have been far smarter to wait for Stalin to attack Germany. That's another story. But my point is, is that's a false narrative. States don't act when they're weak. They act when they are strong, especially when they're on the way up, not when they're on the way down. Yeah, I, I can I can agree with I can agree about that with the second second world war. I'm I'm thinking about the current system and maybe the first world war where we saw the empires vanish, vanish. Yeah, well, they vanished, but they were very healthy in 1914, and they all went to war stupidly against each other. When again, was there any real requirement to do so? I mean, the Austrians didn't need to attack Serbia, and the Germans in Berlin were foolish and stupid because they assumed that this would be contained. Have you heard that word before? Contained. That's one of the reasons why we worry today about what's happening with Israel. You know, we were fortunate in eastern Ukraine that the Russians contained the conflict, not us. We were always willing to pull in anybody we could. That's where you come in as joining NATO. We're trying to drag more people into this hostile alliance aimed at Russia. That's insanity. And these alliances are legacies of a world that doesn't exist anymore. Increasingly, I talk about limited liability partners. I wrote a book called Margin of Victory, and I tried to explain that that is where we all need to go. We need to understand that there are no permanent enemies. There, there, don't, there don't necessarily need to be permanent friends. What you have are interests. And from time to time, your interests coincide, and from time to time, they don't. When they coincide, and it's important, you cooperate. When they don't coincide, you don't cooperate. That doesn't mean you go to war or not go to war. It simply means there are no permanent fixed uh, alliances on the World War I model. And that fixed uh, set of agreements was guilty 
of dragging people into war that otherwise would never have gone. I mean, just imagine you had the Germans in 1914 facing Great Britain. No English-speaking soldier had shot at a German-speaking soldier in history. There was no history of animosity or hostility. There was a lot of paranoia. There was a lot of misinterpretation and lots of arrogance on all sides. But you understand what I'm saying. This is why Finland is a small country. Remember, there's an old expression, small countries do what they have to do. Large countries do what they want to do. You're in danger when you ally yourself with an alliance led by the United States, which has become so hostile to China and Russia and other countries, which I don't think will last, by the way. I think this is a this is a temporary phenomenon, but nevertheless, it's there. You're at risk of being dragged in. In other words, it's almost as though the Finnish Corvette is pulling up next to the giant American battleship. And the giant American battleship says, shut up and get in line and steam with me. And everybody aboard the Finnish Corvette says, oh, great. Now we have a big battleship with us. Yeah, except that look at all the battleships arrayed against it. You're about to be dragged into a battle and you're probably going to be sunk. Does that make sense? It makes no sense at all. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, a couple of a couple of uh, things I wanted to point out. One was the one was you you almost have a peace formula there with the limited liability partnership, um, because that's that's one of the things we should be talking. And what is completely missing from the course is that is there possibility um, to peace? The world is going multipolar. That's for sure. There is no returning back. Um, we, we see China, Russia, India, South Africa, uh, Latin America. We, we, I mean, we, we see that over half of the people on the planet are aligning and want to have their own system. And and so there's clearly going to be two systems, maybe even more. Mm, the military industrial complex is where the money is pumped in. Now everything else is, is secondary. Um, unfortunately, the West is, is sunk in its own ship by shooting its, itself in so many ways. Do you think, do you like, do you believe that we will see a peace in this system or will the system be gone and then we start finding peace? I think uh, the United States and its Western allies are going to see crisis. And I think that crisis is going to compel us to withdraw. In other words, retire these bad policies of hostility and confrontation so that we can focus internally on the problems that we have. I mean, here you have the United States, whose forces are now smaller and probably less lethal than they have been in 50 years. And that's what people don't understand. We, we only have an army of about 450,000. Most of the army that can fight and make any difference on the battlefield is dispersed or distributed from Lithuania all the way to Romania, ostensibly to protect against the great Russian offensive, which is not coming. So what have we got to send to the Middle East? And the answer is practically nothing. We have special forces or special operations forces, very good forces, but very light, designed for a very different environment from the one that is, exists today in the Middle East. At the same time, countries which were previously weak 50 years ago or, or incapable for reasons of technology, are now enormously powerful. Turkey, Iran, perfect examples. And we tend to disparage the Arab states, but they too have access to technologies today that make them much more powerful than they've ever been in the past. You go to Asia and you have a similar phenomenon. Uh, we are continuing to behave as though this were 1991. It's not. 1991 has come and gone in the United States. And that's why my point is that whether people in Washington want to admit it or acknowledge it, they're going to have to make a what I would call a significant about term in the next few years. They're going to have to abandon these expansive policies of military intervention and hostility. They're going to have to come home and deal with the problems we have in the United States, which are at least as serious as the problems you see in France and Germany and other countries today. Our borders are still open. They are undefended, incomprehensible. 
But that's the that's the truth. And the American people, with each passing day, are becoming more exercised over what's happening. They're looking around and discovering, my God, is this my country? Who are all of these people? Where did they come from? Uh, I, I hear similar things from friends in Germany and France and Spain. So I think the, when you talk about peace, I think it'll be a question of we can't afford to do anything else than cope with the problems we have created. We're, we're all going to live in a hell of our own making, frankly. Now, Russia is in a very different position. It's much stronger economically than it's been in the past. It is now being joined through BRICS by many others. I think you're going to see BRICS consist of eventually at least 80 or more countries. You were talking about different systems emerging. I think that's real. And if you look at civilizations, per se, increasingly, Putin represents one civilizational group. Mr. Erdogan, for instance, represents another. Mr. Modi in, in India represents another civilizational group of its own, and so does Xi in China. These places are not going to be, uh, how should I say, sedated consumers of American power and, and influence. They, they are going to chart their own courses. We have not had to live in a world where we were not the center of it. And so people in the United States are in for a shock, not so much the average American, because to be frank with you, the average American could care less what happens beyond his borders. You know, a friend of mine once said, he was a Spanish general staff officer, and he said, Colonel McGregor, the United States is not a country. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, it's a planet. You live on your own planet. Well, right now, the planet wants to plant bases and flags on Finnish soil. It wants to make you a satellite of military power and influence. If I were a Finn, I would say, no thanks. I'm happy to be friendly to the United States, to work with the United States, but I also have neighbors. I do good business with the Russians. I want to get along with the Russians. I'm not interested in going to war with the Russians. If your purpose is in coming to Finland to stimulate hostility to Russia and create conditions conducive to a conflict with Russia, we don't want anything to do with it. You pointed out there almost almost answer to my next question, but I still want to ask it because, yeah, as I told you in the beginning, and I think in a previous interview, we have a mandatory military service, um, a mandatory defense force service, and, and a conscript, which uh, states very, very clearly, uh, which is sworn under oath, that we who swore the oath about 900,000 men, we will defend the inviolability of, of our fatherland. And we have a constitution that states very clearly that we are uh, a sovereign republic. And our defense forces draw their mandates from the law where the only job is to secure the territorial integrity and protect the constitutional rights and freedoms of the people. Um, of course, there's some others, other, others too, but these are the main, main things. So what would be your message to a Finnish reserve uh, reservist uh, who is thinking that uh, this constitutes basically a treason where, where uh, this kind of contract, already the NATO contract, constitutes, in my mind, the treason. I'm not the one who can judge it, but um, I can give an opinion. I'm a, I'm a reservist sergeant, so that's my opinion as a sergeant, that that's a, that's a treasonous act, as would uh, the contract be. So what, what would you say? I mean, there is 870,000 men, 880,000 men in this country who has won this oath. Has won this oath. Well, keep in mind that we've managed to convince millions of Americans in the 1960s that we were going to Vietnam to defend liberal democracy, the rights of man, and our own country. It was all nonsense, completely false. We had 58 million dead, another 100,000 wounded. Finally, after 10 years, we left. In the meantime, we killed 200, 2 million Vietnamese. And for what? It was ridiculous. We have been making <clears throat> these false claims for I don't know how long, certainly since 1965, and pretending that we are somehow or another 
improving the world and making it better because of our presence. Well, if you live in the Middle East and you look at the state of the Middle East right now, it's very hostile to us. The people that live there do not feel that they have benefited from the presence of U.S. military power and our interference. And I think they're right. This business of interventionism is dangerous. And as I said at the beginning, I think we're coming to the end of it because Americans are finally waking up and figuring out that while we like to wear the white hat, we want to be the good guys, we haven't been. And we want to stop being what we were. But right now, Washington is living on its own, inside its own bubble. You don't want to be dragged into this. Your constitution, as it reads, makes sense. That was essentially the attitude of Bismarck's Germany. Bismarck was approached several times about waging preemptive war to save Germany. And he said preemptive war is effectively the same as committing suicide because you are afraid of death. He was right. In the 20th century, people lost their way in Germany and elsewhere. They, they walked away from sound logic and rationality. Your constitution is spot on, and you should cling to that. And when someone approaches you and says, well, we would like Finnish troops to do something, you need to look very carefully at what they're asking those troops to do. Even during the Second World War under von Mannerheim, von Mannerheim was very sensitive to preserving Finland at all costs. He was a staunch anti-communist, and therefore, because he was an anti-communist, was understandably sympathetic to the Germans who were trying to annihilate communism. But he would not overextend Finland to the point where he risked making Finland a permanent enemy of the Soviet Union at that point and ultimately putting it at risk of destruction. My point is that whoever is in charge in your country, in every country, has to always think first and foremost, whatever I do, my first objective is to preserve my country, my country's power, influence, economic health. That's number one. Don't ask me to, to do something which puts that at risk. My argument is that because NATO has transformed from something that I think was originally very good into something which is not, into something which is not in our interest or in the interest of our European allies, a hostile, aggressive alliance in search of people to attack. You know, the the state is in, the saying in the 1990s was if NATO is not operating out of area, in other words, operating overseas in the Middle East in Afghanistan or Asia or something, then it's out of business. And I remember many of my European colleagues and some of my American colleagues who said, well, if there's no enemy here to fight, then why do we have to have the alliance? Why are we looking for new enemies to attack? So my, my point to you is if you're, if you're thinking clearly, and I think your constitution is a very carefully thought out document, you got to ask the question, how does it help Finland to become allied with this aggressive anti-Russian alliance? Because there's no reason for us to be at war with Russia. We, I'm talking about the United States, none whatsoever. We cooperated with the Russians during the 1990s on numerous occasions. We cooperated with them during the so-called uh, war on terrorism. They were very helpful to us and continue to provide us useful intelligence. We have decided, or when I say we, this government in Washington has decided to turn what should have been a short-lived conflict in the eastern portion of Ukraine and ended. In other words, it should have been contained there and rapidly ended through negotiation. We've turned that into an opportunity, we thought, to destroy Russia. The opposite has occurred. Russia is now more powerful and more capable than it has been since the 1980s. And at this particular point in time, when we are weaker than we have ever been, certainly since 1991, and I would argue in probably 50 years, you want to join us in an anti-Russian alliance? That makes no sense. There is something with our president and Biden that uh, we don't know yet what's going on there, but they are some, there is something there. Uh, the time is almost up. I, I wanted to ask you about uh, 
you said about the positive development in the US. You said that people are waking up. Um, you, you are now engaged in the, our country, our choice. And, and, and I've been listening to many of your interviews. What kind of, what inspiring, what good things uh, do you see? How do you see the waking up happening? And and uh, is it uh, how do you look at it? How do you look to the future? Or do you look at it positively? Well, two things uh, are underway right now. One is that more and Amer more Americans who have historically voted for one of the two major parties, Republican or Democrat, have discovered that it doesn't make a great deal of difference for whom you vote. You get the same policies over and over and over again. That's why we hear very few voices uh, raising opposition to creating conflict in eastern Ukraine that could lead to a major regional war. No, they're, they're not raising those issues, but Americans are looking at it and saying, I don't think we really want to go to war with Russia. That's not in our interest. Now in the Middle East, we have a, a similar but even more dangerous set of circumstances where Americans are saying, yes. Israel should survive. Absolutely, we support that. But we don't want to go to war with Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Syria. In other words, there are limits to our interests. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier. Americans say, number one is we, we need to protect our country. We're not doing that. We're not protecting our borders. We're not enforcing our laws. We're tolerating criminality in our cities on a scale that has never really happened in the history of the American people. That's number one. Number two, our, our economy is, is not strong. People in Washington say, well, the underlying fundamentals are great. Look at the stock market. Well, the stock market doesn't tell you anything about the true state of the economy. It's, it's a large casino, which exists and operates at the convenience of a small minority of very wealthy people. They're beginning to figure that out. And they're also beginning to discover that this thing called inflation is linked to the ruined economy and this decrepit, anachronistic, I would argue, corrupt financial system. And they're saying, my God, I can't afford to put food on the table. Our middle class is dying. Some would say it's almost gone. These things are beginning to sink in. Now, when will this all turn around? It could happen tomorrow morning. It could happen in six months. It could happen in a year. But at some point, the politicians in Washington are going to have to listen to the people that elected them, or they're going to be out of a job. They'll be replaced. That's coming. And that's really my point. And that's why at this particular point in the history of the, of the Western world, building this alliance designed to be hostile to Russia and by implication China makes no sense. Because those countries are not interested in going to war with us. And we shouldn't be interested in going to war with them. So, again, my message to the Finns, you have a wonderful country. You've worked hard to keep it that way. You need to preserve it and protect it. And that, that runs the whole range of issues for you. Some of the same issues on immigration and uh, enforcing laws and cracking down on criminality apply to you, to Sweden, to France, to Germany, just as they apply to us. And I think these things are going to change. I think we're moving in new directions. But the worst thing you can do at this stage, in my judgment, is to invite somebody to show up and say, well, do you mind? Uh, I, I just want to put several batteries of theater ballistic missiles right on the border with Russia to threaten Russia. You don't mind if I do that, do you? That's insane. Jonathan, thank you so much for your very valuable insights. Uh, we'll get this message to the Finnish people and and uh, all the best. Thank you for your work. Thank you for speaking out uh, frequently. I don't know if you have any time for any other 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 life, but but uh, thank you so much because I I and I know a lot of other people are enjoying your insights and getting their heads around this mess we. Well, Remember, our, our country, our choice exists for all the reasons that I've outlined. It's very focused on, on the kinds of things we're discussing. And I think you would benefit from a similar movement in your own country. It's your country. It's your choice. It's not Washington's. And I would keep that in mind. God bless Finland and good luck to you. God bless you, Dakota. Thank you.